I'm Frederick Gerton, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And, Miss Advocate, we've got a letter. It's actually beautiful. It's handwritten. It's, it says, Leilani Farah and Frederick Gerton at WG Film, Malmo, Sweden. And it's sent from Kansas City, Missouri. Missouri. Oh, my gosh. Do you know that Kansas City is in Missouri? Oh, I do I, know that. I actually <laughs> been to Kansas City. I was invited to speak at the media law conference. So I was the keynote speaker and talking with like the top bunch of American media lawyers at their luncheon Amazing. Uh, after my bananas experience. I've been there and I actually know that the state of Kansas starts almost, you know, inside. I mean, Kansas City has suburbs and then the suburbs are in Kansas, the other state. But this is not that easy. You know, Donald Trump also mixed up these states. He said the, the, the great people of right. Kansas City, Kansas. But I knew I know more. Anyway, so we got a letter from, um, it's actually not signed with a name, but it's, but it's a listener to your podcast, Pushback Talks, and she's, she really likes the podcast, and she, she wants us to look into that Blackstone is moving into Kansas City, and actually the suburb based in Kansas. This is ongoing. We will post this letter out on our social media, so you can have a look at it. Mm. Uh, Leilani, last week we had the Danish housing minister in, on our show, Kåre Dybved, and we have, we've gotten some, some feedback. Well, we got feedback after that podcast because the housing minister has, is involved in new legislation and policy about trying to ensure communities are diverse. They are using this language that's upsetting non-Western, trying to limit the numbers of non-Western people in particular neighborhoods. It's kind of very ugly language. It's very ugly language. To say. So the Danes have this um, way of using language in a strange way sometimes, I think, especially in the... Uh, it's a way of... I think the Social Democrats, which Corey is, they, it's a way of um, taking grounds away from the, from the populist right by also partly using their language, which I think is... Is horrible. Anyway, but I mean, we people in our podcast are guests because we are interested in some parts of what they do. It's not an endorsement of their whole political life. I mean, I remember we had a mayor of Berlin in, in Push, and he was a part of uh, selling out Berlin once upon a time. So, of course, a lot of people are angry with him, but he also admitted and said something we did was wrong. And I think that's interesting. I'm still not endorsing all his policies. It's, it's no. not about that. No, absolutely not. And if we if we limited our podcast to interviewing people who are in politics but are pure and have a pure record, we will have no one to interview. <laughs> no, I but mean, today today we have a special guest, and that's from South Africa. We have a, a young activist, a lawyer like you, and it's Mandisa Shandu from a foundation called Endifuna Ukwasi. What are why are we having Mandisa on the show? Mandisa's group is doing some amazing work at the local level, um, trying to reclaim property for black South Africans. And uh, I just love them. They're young and they're scrappy and they're using the law and they're using mobilization, all sorts of techniques uh, to make a difference. Welcome to Pushback Talk, Mandisa. Welcome, Mandisa. Hi, hi to you and the listeners. Really, really interested and excited to be here. So tell me, I mean, you're a member of a very cool NGO called Endifuna Ukwasi. If that's pronounced right, I don't know, but I could I at least try it. What are you up to? So um, I'm the director at Endifuna Ukwasi, the organization you've mentioned. And we're an activist organization and law center that combines community organizing, research, uh, the use of law through litigation and other means, um, as well as communications and media in highly visible provocative campaigns to advance urban land justice in Cape Town. For us, advancing urban land justice means making land available 
um, and, you know, towards unlocking it for the purposes of affordable housing. So very proactive strategy that's coupled also with resisting evictions and displacement, um, which is something that's ongoing in Cape Town and cities across um, South Africa and indeed the world. Yeah, I mean... And I mean, for us who have been following South Africa since the years of apartheid, I mean, it was a really big issue also here in Sweden, I guess, in Canada. I mean, our government with our former prime minister, Olaf Palme, supported ANC. And Sweden was the first country where Nelson Mandela flew to after 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 being released from prison. And, and, and I was there when he came to Stockholm. I actually also went, met him in 1990 in, in Cape Town and was able to interview Mandela. But it's, it's so obvious that the, the, the land has been an issue always. And, and, and when the, the scars of, of your town, Cape Town, is also the scars of apartheid, because the apartheid regime had its Group Areas Act, where actually they said that this area is from now on white, and all the rest of you have, just have to go. And then they kicked people out from all the, the nice places in town. And, and I was recently back in Cape Town. And it's obvious that if you are in a taxi or you know, in an Uber or something, nobody who's driving lives in town. Everybody has to commute for hours. And so it's, it's uh, in some way when I was back compared to the 80s and 90s is that the city of Cape Town is now m kind of more segregated than, than it was during apartheid which is kind of a very sad story. So I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear how, what your strategies are around to, to get some more space for the people of Cape Town, because it seems like the people of Cape Town has actually been moved out of their own city. Yeah, I mean, what you're articulating is, is exactly the experience of hundreds and thousands of people who live in the city um, in peripheral locations um, of the city, but really haven't come to a, a space or a sense of belonging. And that's informed by various things. Of course, historically, um, that's the most obvious. We come from a very hurtful, um, harmful, violent history, um, where I think the most common, most obvious thing in South Africa's history ac across the country is that our history is one of, of, of mass dispossession and dispossession of so much towards, I guess, um, ensuring that the party government's objective of racial as well as economic exclusion through segregation could be achieved. That, of course, is now compounded by contemporary aspects of our land and housing issues, um, which I'm sure we'll get into as we converse more. Mm. Leilani, you've been to Cape Town. I have been to Cape Town a couple of times, and uh, both because I've been there and because I tend to read a lot, it's what I what I f know about Cape Town, what I felt when I was there is this inequality, gross, entrenched systemic inequality that you've just described, uh, Mendisa. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how that manifests in Cape Town along economic and racial lines. I mean, we know, like, it was on the cover of Time magazine, Cape Town, the most unequal city in the world. And they talked about um, the race dimension and the, the poverty dimension with, you know, more than 50% of your population living on like $75 a month. But can you describe the inequality as it manifests in terms of housing, land, what it's like in the city? Mm. So, I mean, you're absolutely right, I think, to articulate that our inequality is is one that is, is, is really deep and has almost shaped the face of the city. Um, in Cape Town, um, people have really articulated this city being one where it's almost two completely different wor worlds. In one world, you know, there's just an abundance um, in terms of access to resources, um, in terms of being able to live a safe and dignified life. Um, and, and the other side, um, and this is visible, right? There's another world where people are really living below the poverty line and struggling to get by on a day-to-day -day basis, struggling with access to almost every single basic service that would contribute to a dignified life. The inequality, therefore, is, is of course racial because this is something that's informed um, very directly by our history of racial segregation through the apartheid government and before. Um, it's obviously um, also gendered. 
um, with women, and this is an issue that is also, I think, in common in cities and, and even in rural areas across the world, that um, women struggling even more to gain access to land and other services, including, um, you know, as sanitation, housing. Um, but an important one in Cape Town is that our inequality is also spatial. The spatial kind of dynamic, which has so many implications for the way that the city looks and feels and indeed how people can access it. Um, and including, I, I guess, on a, on, a, on a personal level, how people have an opportunity at all to interact and, 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 and break from the past in a way that black people aren't only seen as servicing, working the city and having to tra- travel, you know, 40 kilometers or up to two hours because of our terrible public transport systems um, each way um, and having their home lives and their work lives completely separated. No, that's, a, that's my experience from Cape Town, that you, uh, it's, it's a very beautiful town, <laughs> but it's not a town for all. And, and, uh, and living out in Kailicha and sitting uh, waiting for the bus or, you know, there is a train coming in from some areas, but it's like it's very slow and it's not efficient. And it's a lot of and I, I, I saw you have a big taxi strike the other day or it, it, last year and it, it was or a public transport strike. And that affected a lot of people commuting to work and school. So it's there, it is a big issue. So. I guess, I mean, I understand your ambition is to, to house people in town again so people actually could work and, you know, live close to their work because most of the jobs are in, in town, what I understand. What I also understand is that you're, you're focusing on land that still is owned by the government to use that land for something that is good for, for all. I think the first thing is to acknowledge that there's a sense of power that comes from the land. Um, then we have to ask ourselves, what now of current parcels of land? Um, and so our strategy has been one to look at land and to look at power where it exists um, and where it's also been with, with, withheld. Um, I think the most important thing in our advocating for the unlocking of land in well-located areas is that there hasn't been that break from the past that doesn't necessarily say you must live here because this is closer to an economic opportunity, but gives me, it gives an opportunity rather for the choice to have um, access to all parts of the city. And that choice being something that hasn't existed, of course, because of our history and the various barriers to accessing land. So what, what are the barriers? I guess the barriers are money, basically, isn't it? The idea um, that money is the barrier is a huge one. And I want to emphasize idea because I think that when we have these discussions, it's an ideological position that almost seems as if though it's, it's a fact. Um, and that's really a, a viewing, I think, of land that emphasizes it as a tradable commodity and not one that has this huge, significant historical social value and really the ability to leverage um, a, a restructuring of society that will give meaning to so many of the constitutional rights that we and others are fighting for on a daily basis. And so the idea that land ought to be held um, on a speculative basis is not consistent with the idea of unlocking land for these other uses, advancing socioeconomic rights, but also towards building more sustainable city. What's so interesting is what you're battling in Cape Town is what I've seen in San Francisco. And I mean, it's so amazing. Not It's not just the economics of keeping some people out of the city, the people who service the city actually live really far away. It's race lines as well. I mean, in the United States, it's the poorest who are racialized communities that are being pushed out. So the parallels are quite uncanny. I also wanted to just comment on the idea of that you that your organization is looking for lands very purposefully to disrupt existing structures, trying to change the way land is viewed, the relationship between individuals and lands and governments and lands. Is that right? Yes, 100%. Basically, I think land and housing activists across the country are really um, trying to undo that which is holding the st- structural racism in place. 
Um, and one of the things that are holding that in place is where people live and how they access the city. In Cape Town, for example, the people who are on the ha- housing waiting list are almost h- half a million um, families. Um, and, you know, it's, it's probably a lot more than that, acknowledging that not everybody is on the housing waiting list. Um, and also acknowledging that people can't live on lists. Where are they living in the meantime? Um, <laughs> you can't live on a list. Yeah. You no, can't live the, on a list. The, the list is for social housing, is that what you yeah. mean? Or, or government-supported housing? This is for state-assisted housing. So there's this immense need and a growing need. Um, but what we also know is true is that land, it's finite. And it's scarce. And so in the context of this finite, um, scarce, I guess, family jewel being land, um, we have to act on specific sites to, to, to make demands on either that they don't be sold off for a short term capital injection to a private party or is not used for very exclusive, um, exclusionary purposes. For example, these vast tracts of golf, um, passes of land that are used for, for golf. I like that. I don't like golf. <laughs> Me so neither. It's, uh, so, so just go out there and, and grab some golf courses. Well, that's really radical, Frederick. How can you say something like that? But it's interesting because people have been actually been forcibly removed when they built the, the golf courses once upon a time. So it's, it is, of course, not so long ago. Everything around the, the coast where the fishermen were living, the, they were also kicked out of their homes because some other people wanted to have nice summer houses. That's like the story of around South Africa. So one group's recreation was the, the homes of another group. So I think that would be interesting to to grab some golf courses. That could be that could be a story. <laughs> well, Mandisa, didn't your organization launch a campaign? in 2019 around golf courses? That's right. Um, We launched a campaign um, together with our social movement partner, Reclaim the City, um, to hashtag redistribute this land. (laughs) Um, And (laughs) this land being um, parcels of land that are owned by the municipality, the city government, and are leased out for exclusive purposes and have the potential to restructure the city if unlocked and used differently. Golf um, is a huge one. Golf courses on uh, municipal owned land are leased out for nominal amounts at a sport, sporting tariff. And of course, used by a very limited number of people who are using this as a, you know, re- recreational activity. There's a blindedness approach to what's happening and who's being um, responded to, who's being protected. A question of entitlement and entitlement to play golf versus a right, a right to housing, and find ways to prioritize now more than ever before the right to housing. This is kind of cool. You, I mean, here I am talking to two lawyers, two <laughs> cool, um, hard-rocking lawyers, one in Cape Town and one in Ottawa, and now we're talking about, is, is there a, a human right of playing golf? Uh, you the <laughs> lawyers <laughs> or is it or is there a human right of housing no <laughs> there is not okay there is a human right to housing there certainly is in the constitution of south africa there is certainly not the human right to play golf um now the argument on the other side is well you know golf generates a whole lot of dollars tourism dollars etc the city could argue well if you get rid of golf courses then you're undermining our resources that might be available for things like affordable social housing. My argument against that is one, there's no line. I don't see the line between um, all these profits made off of golf courses and then that money trickling to social housing. Yeah, but and the tourism is a factor in many cities and many cities live out of tourism. Also, Cape Town does because it's such a beautiful place. But we have been talking a lot about Barcelona, for example. Barcelona suddenly over 10 years or less got... 400, more than 400,000 apartments out on Airbnb, on the short rental market. Of course, also in a, in a big city in Spain, 400,000 homes away to the tourist market means that you're pushing a lot of families out. And of course, this is the same thing happens in Cape Town. There is a lot of apartments out on Airbnb and, and short-term rentals. And I, the worst thing, I, I was when I was in Cape Town the last time I was... Some friend was at a party and he said, come by. It was in Camps Bay, which is kind of a a fancy part of town. 
and and it was Christmas time, and I looked around, and almost every apartment in the condos, extremely expensive condos, st- stood empty. So we have the, we also have the the ghost towers, the ghost departments, in a in a place where people don't have homes. So the city needs to welcome the tourists, but you still need the Cape Townians to be in town. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess what we're we're thinking about here is how do we unlock this intransigence? I was speaking to somebody the other day who articulated it as we need to start seeing and viewing housing as a verb um, because some so much happens around it. Um, and depending on where it is and how it's built will shape so much more as opposed to a noun um, that allows the state to say, well, actually, we have built X, Y, Z units. There they are. Um, and our job is da- done. Um, and in order for us to really experience this idea of housing as a verb that has, depending on where it is and what's done with it, so many implications for access to so many other related rights and more importantly, sense of dignity um, and equality, which are also constitutionally ent- entrenched rights, um, means that we have to disrupt the, the, the status quo. And these arguments that are used to maintain the status quo, um, we are actively challenging on the streets, in the courts, um, because it really is something that will move us further and further away from um, the social contract, which is our constitutional mandate to to, to work towards a more uh, transformed society. Mm. There is an ongoing struggle. uh, It's called a Tafelberg struggle. Can you can you update us on that? What is what is the the, the struggle? In 2016, uh, the Funawazi um, organization I work for, uh, together with Reclaim the City, launched a campaign which actually you know gave life to the Reclaim the City campaign to stop the sale of a parcel of land in Seapoint, which is a predominantly white area, which was designated as such through the Group Areas Act in the 50s at the peak of apartheid, and also uh, a predominantly affluent area, which um, if black people are accessing, it's mostly to work either as car guards, as domestic workers, as waitresses, um, but not really to have access to as a home. Now, a lot of the women that we met in this campaign had lived in the area um, either in basements or really just trying to make small spaces work and had been struggling and actually fighting for access to a space in that area since the 90s. In 2016, this specific parcel of land, we went to court to challenge its sale. It's a parcel of land that's owned by the provincial government and was said to be sold to a private school for 135 million rand. And what made it specifically, I guess, distasteful was that this is a parcel of land that had finally been earmarked for affordable housing through the mechanism of social housing. Um, Social housing important for us because it's a form of housing that specifically targets racial, economic, and spatial restructuring. In any event, uh, we, we went to court to, to stop the sale. And last year, uh, four years later, we got a really great progressive judgment in our favor. And the, the, the sale has since been reversed with the, the school relinquishing its, its, its interest, its rights, um, and so not proceeding. What that means for us now is that there's a great opportunity and momentum to discuss and take forward this question of how this and other parcels of land can and should be used differently because we've got the support of a really important judgment which talks about two important intersecting rights. We've talked now about the right to housing, but there's something I think really powerful that happens when we link that to another constitutional right of access to land on an equitable basis because then that allows us to start thinking about disrupting what holds the structural issues in place. Right now, um, we are going to be back in court with the province and the city government challenging this this, this judgment and wanting to take it on appeal. Um, but it is one of the first judgments of this kind. Um, and so there's a huge public interest in ensuring, I guess, that we continue the fight. Mm. 
I'm giving you a standing ovation. Tafelberg is such an important case. Everything you said about the judgment is is uh, very important. I also want our listeners to know how unique this case is. I also found it unusual, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mandisa, but the national level government and Reclaim the City ended up being together in terms of what they were arguing, what you were arguing against the province and the city. And so that's quite unusual. Um, I thought the judgment itself said basically that different orders or levels of government need to interact more and talk more and should be in discussion before these sorts of decisions are taken. Highly unusual. And then the judgment also said that people need to be engaged much earlier in the process of determining how land is used. You can't just make the decision and then engage with people. You got to engage with with um, stakeholders, let's say, earlier. I hope I haven't misread the judgment in that regard, but those were th- a couple of things or three things that I pulled out. Uh, a really, really important case. And the idea, and just lastly, I'll say, I think it's amazing, this idea that we can, we, everyday people, organizations like Reclaim the City, movements, can have um, a say in how land is used, that we don't have to just sit back and watch it all happen, that we can really get engaged in this, in, in the process and disrupt. I mean, South Africa has, a, in the history of resistance in South Africa, the law has been used a lot. So there's been a lot of progressive lawyers. I mean, Gandhi was in in South Africa, Mandela was a lawyer, and you know, and so there has been a lot of uh, progressive lawyers. I think young people should study law and, 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 and use the law as a tool. Of course, we also need to change the laws. But I, I mean, South Africa's constitution is very progressive, and it's, it's cool to see that it can work. I mean, I, I did a film recently together with my friend Sylvia Vollenhoven, from, also from Cape Town, about the legacy of gold mining, Josie Gold, which you can find on, on the wgfilm.com website if you want to see it. But it's also there... Th- the, the courts are really important and, and the, the constitution is a good support in, in that struggle. So it's, it's good. Is there, if there is a good constitution, use it and, and hit the market powers in the head with it. I think that's what we need to do. <laughs> I'd like to hear Mandisa on that. What I mean, I, I will put to you, Mandisa, and, um, that I am often told that a legislated or constitutional right to housing uh, isn't really that useful. And a lot of people will point to South Africa and say, look at how unequal things still are with respect to housing. And the right to housing hasn't really benefited the people of um, of South Africa and the blacks uh, of South Africa. I would like to know what you what you're thinking is about your constitution, you're young, you, you've, you've grown up with this constitution. Um, how do you, what do you think about the fact that you have the constitutional right to housing and access uh, to land in your constitution? We definitely see the benefit of having a constitutionally entrenched right to housing, which, as I mentioned, coupled with various other socioeconomic rights, as well as this right of access to land on an equitable basis, is is at the cornerstone of what it is that we're trying to achieve. And so the, uh, the fact that it is um, constitutionally entrenched brings legitimacy to, to the cause and to the struggle. Another part of the answer to that question for me is, is thinking about well, what would happen if we didn't have these constitutionally entrenched rights. I'm just trying to think of that scenario, but what we'd be up against is almost an invisible perpetrator that's completely violent without the tools to, to take on that ba- battle and completely violent in the, ter- in the sense of not being able to be regulated, people not being able to claim that this is my right too, irrespective of how long that might take. 
um, you're still able to say this is my right to housing, to not be dispossessed, to not be displaced, to not be forcibly removed. This is the context of our history and this is something that we're actively through the social contract of a constitution breaking from and you don't get to opt out of this entrenched right that I have. Um, and so that's absolutely um, critical and so it becomes I think almost central in our struggles to say that this is people fighting for intersecting rights, dignity equality, housing, and land. And, and I think that without that, then, as I mentioned, the power to, to marginalize um, would be un, uh, really difficult to, ch to challenge. Mm, that's cool. So, mm -hmm. Mandisa, now you've been, you studied law, you've been into this struggle for a long time, and it's it feels like you're actually moving stuff so what what do you think well what were you what will you be in 10 years you know, can it grow bigger this movement can you can you bring people back to town again um well okay before looking forward <laughs> i think um <laughs> it might be helpful to just look i i i i, I always <laughs> want to have this dreamy you know that's my yeah you know um, you know, filmmaker in film, we can just mm. cut to a dream, yeah. you know, so that's why I, mean. I was, I was just trying, no. but so no, it's no. fine. You can be down at the earth. <laughs> do both, do both. <laughs> I wanted to just reflect on not uh, too far long ago, but maybe just the last five years in terms of thinking about what's possible, because Lefuno Gwazi started this work, um, towards the end of 2015, beginning of 2016. And so in the last few years, we've really started and acted on a discussion in the city around urban land justice, spatial justice, using land in well-located areas in a way that hadn't um, happened before. And so that became really important first to expose um, in a different way to say that this is not okay. And not to say that there wasn't housing activism in the city before, but one of the things that we realized was that a lot of the housing activism happened in, in, in places that are almost out of sight, out of mind. So people who are resisting evictions or the demolition of their homes, um, struggling for access to services. And because of the spatial kind of inequality that I mentioned earlier, it really is a matter of out of sight, out of mind from the perspective of some of the city officials or the decision makers. And so the question for us had to be then about how do we think about power differently? Um, how do we bring these issues, these struggles to the center, to the heart of the city where it matters? Um, and so this was part of our strategy. And what that has led to is a stopping the sale of, 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 a, of, of, of a significant parcel of land, of exposing inequality and how inequality repeats itself or, or rather is deepened through the repetition of certain decision making processes. And also how um, for we, we've we also been able to bring in, I guess, this discussion, uh, bring the private sector into this, this discussion, acknowledging that, yes, the state is a critical and important player in terms of its obligations to house people and to ensure that people aren't evicted um, into homelessness uh, and, 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 and other things. But the private sector, too, has a role. And so our work has brought them into the conversation in a really important and significant way. This is something that's happened in a, a relatively short space of time if we think about history. But I think going forward, it would be about building on that so that not every single step of the way is one that's either a crisis um, because the discourse, hopefully, um, and the imagination of what's possible would have shifted. Mm, I love this, the, to keep the imagination of what is possible. I think that's like a very good line. And and that's a very good line to send out to, to, to people around the world. If we start to imagine what is possible and, you know, it, and stop seeing the hurdles, there will always be a lot of hurdles. <laughs> but you obviously was able to find a, a way to imagine the possible. And I, that's cool. I love it. Isn't it. Absolutely. And now, Mandisa, I'm thinking, how can the shift work with you? <laughs> that's my new entity. Um, you guys are doing really incredible things. And if we could support you in any way, um, export your, your work to others around the world, I think we need to do that. You're, you're very inspiring, as is your organization.
Thank you. We have certainly learned so much from people across the world. So I think the work to do is to build on on, on, on those relationships and build on a global response, particularly in this moment. So I guess it's about how do we think global, act local. That's right. And and the film Push, which features the the very special Leilani Farah uh, in her struggle as a UN Special Rapporteur when, when I follow her around the world. You saw the film has been shown in South Africa also, and you've seen it. When you saw it, did, was there anything that came through your mind that, okay, this is also, this global pattern also exists in my town? Oh, yes, definitely. What I really appreciate is how it humanized every all the, the, the people who are featured, their daily kind of struggle. And I think if we, look, if we move from that um, basis, that human basis, then there's so much more um, that we can build on. I think another thing that really resonated, for as long as, you know, the market conditions are dominant and we're not building a counter or um, an alternative, uh, building on an alternative imagination, we're all dealing with a similar violent perpetrator being the market and that there is an ability to resist and fight back. There was a scene where you, Leilani, were in the boardroom um, with all these players and it was like, this is this is what we're trying to do. We're getting a seat at the table to make some, uh, some demands. This is cool. I think we should wrap up. It's, it's, I mean, inspiration is important too because a lot of us can f sometimes feel out oh, it's hopeless, it's so difficult, they are so strong, we are so weak. But I mean, with inspirational people like you, Mendisa, life is easier. So it's thank you for your energy and thank you for doing, for, for keeping this good work up all the time. So we'll, we certainly would like to follow up on in the future, what, what, how, how it goes down there. Thank you. Thank you so much for the connection. Yeah. Thank you, Mandisa. And, and thanks you. Thank you, Leilani. Um, it is, it, it's, it will be an interesting season, this one. So, so stay with pushback talks. Uh, we are, we will publish every week. We have now moved to, to Wednesdays. And if you like us, please find a way to support us. You can actually go to something called patreon.com, patreon.com, and go for pushback talks. And if, you, if you're not rich, you can also say, I want to put $2 a month, and then you can do it. So I feel like you, you're giving us a beer a month, you know, not even a glass of wine because it's more <laughs> expensive. But I mean, so it's a beer a month to Frederick and Leilani, and then it's easier for us to keep going because we're doing this without any funds and you don't hear any stupid commercial messages uh, in our podcast because we don't really like that. We are so cool, so we don't want <laughs> to have that. We just want to have beers from our friends. So support us on patreon.com pushback talks and talk soon talk soon thanks frederick and thanks mandisa pushback talks is produced by wg film to watch push visit pushthefilm.com you can also support us by becoming a patreon at patreon.com pushback talks thank you so much for listening and we'll see you again next week